Okay, so number one, if iodide ion is more concentrated in the follicle cells than in the blood, what does that look like? You were going to draw a picture of the cell. Where's the iodide? Where's most of it? In the cell, not in the blood. But I need more to move into the cell out of the blood. So am I going with or against the concentration gradient? Against. And what process am I going to use anytime I have to pump something against the concentration gradient? Active transport. Okay? Does that make sense to everybody? You have a uniporter. What does that mean? Uniport? It just carries that one thing. You have little on your thyroid cells that make thyroid hormone. There are these little, it's just like chock full of them. And you can actually concentrate iodide up to 400 times as concentrated as it is in the blood. It's the only place in the body where iodine is absorbed. So if I need to do um, radioactive imaging of the thyroid gland, what do I use for that? Iodine. Actually, you don't even have to use radioactive. You can just use iodine. And it gets picked up by the thyroid. Uh, on the other hand, if you have thyroid cancer and they want to treat it with radioactivity, what do they use? Radioactive iodine. Uh, iodine. Okay, any questions about that? All right, number two, why does the chemistry, let me see, I think I have the answers on the next page. Let me just go to that. Uh, number two, what is it about the chemistry of the thyroid hormone that allows it? It's got that big, huge R group that's hydrophobic. How many of you knew that, figured that out? Yay. One, two? What happened to the rest of you guys? What were you thinking? Just puzzled and stumped? That, what? It does have a, a carrier that allows it to go across, but it can diffuse in. It just doesn't diffuse in as fast as we used to think. So it has to be lipid soluble to get across that membrane by simple diffusion. So even though, yes, it has a transporter, it can diffuse. All right, how does wasting ATP result in heat generation? Any chemical reaction releases energy. ATP, that is a high energy bond, releases a lot of energy. Okay, did anybody not know that one? Everybody remember that? Okay, um, what about number four? What did I ask you to do for number four? And did you draw a picture of one hormone? How many hormones did I ask you to draw? Draw a graph showing the relative levels of TSH and thyroid hormone. Two hormones, TSH and the thyroid hormone. Over time. So what's our graph going to look like? So it's going to be graphed over time, right? Concentration of the hormones over time. So if they stay in the normal range, then they're going to go up and then down because of negative feedback, right? But if that's the thyroid hormone, what does the graph of the thyroid stimulating hormone look relative to that? Opposite. Very good. So if you looked at a graph of that, it would look kind of like that. Does that make sense to everybody? Because it's regulated by negative feedback. When one goes up, the other goes down. When that goes down, it makes the other one go up again. Make sense? Even if you didn't get it right, when I asked you to draw it, would it make sense? Okay, that was our endocrine break. Hope you enjoyed that. All right, so now we're going to go back to where we kind of left off, which is <clears throat> mutations in the DNA cause changes in the structure of the proteins. 
we're going to look at, <coughs> excuse me, at some specific applications of that. Many of the proteins you produce in your cells are enzymes. We rarely in a and assign you to learn the names of the enzymes. So I think it's important every once in a while to just stop and pay homage to all those enzymes because so many of your cellular processes depend on them. <clears throat> You're absolutely dependent on them. So we've already gone through the steps of transcription and translation. I think we're going to move on with that and look at some of the issues associated with um, reproduction. Let me, because I gave you that kind of segue, I'm just going to change the order a little bit here. And we'll do cell cycle last and talk about those genetic mutations now. So this story is so phenomenal, um, a very famous genetics writer actually wrote a book about it. Labor congenital amaurosis is a condition in which the retina of the eye is damaged. Come back to that. And what you're seeing in this image is a normal eye. And on the far left, what you're seeing is the point of attachment of the retina to the optic nerve. And what you're seeing in the midline, that dark spot, is where um, it's the focal point. It's where the highest concentration of cones in your eye is located. And here you're seeing the eye of someone with amaurosis with LCA. And what you're seeing is that the optic disc, the point of attachment, is fairly normal. Where is that nice focal point, that nice sharp focal point? It's flat, not there. And this is a, a condition that develops fairly rapidly in infancy. And these kids are just like blind within months. So at a time when many kids are learning to get up and navigate and walk around and recognize their mom and their dad. These kids are stumbling and falling and they're um, absolutely enthralled with any source of bright light because that's about all they can see and then even that is gone. Okay, so the, this is a genetic mutation. It's a fairly rare genetic mutation and it's one that in fact we have managed to do genetic engineering for. So I don't know how familiar you are with genetic engineering, but in genetic engineering what we do is we um, create in a laboratory the normal DNA sequence that a gene is supposed to have without the defect that the baby was born with. And then we use some kind of a vector to introduce that gene into their cells. This is easier to do with marrow cells than it is with retinal cells. How am I going to get it into marrow cells? Um, you know, we really don't have to do that. There's a very cool trick with marrow cells. I can extract them, not usually with a drill, with a syringe. So I can punch a syringe through the sternum and extract marrow. I personally can't do any of these things. But we, as a scientific community, can take those cells, filter out the ones that we need to repair, which are usually the stem cells of white blood cells that are defective, if the immune system's defective, um, through a vector, introduce the corrected gene, go through those cells through some assessment process and take just the ones that it worked in, stick those cells back in the individual, those cells find their own way back to the marrow. So you can just inject, inject them peripherally and somehow they know when they get home. They're circulating through the blood and they get out in the marrow, which is a pretty cool trick. And that actually, by the way, has worked in many cases. What they had to do for LCA was actually inject it into the eyeball. And as soon as you tell me you want to inject my eyeball, I'm like, no thanks. Appreciate it, but no, that sounds horrible. Um, but that's exactly what they did. Now the vector they're using is a virus that has been stripped of its own genes. You know, viruses infect cells. They inject their own DNA into their uh, host cells. So they take, a, they take a kind of a virus that 
um, they've worked with for years that they know infects human cells of this type or that type, and they take out their own DNA and put in the engineered DNA, and they inject it. So this kid that we were looking at the picture of a minute ago was one of the first cases where they did genetic engineering with LCA. And they told the parents, you know, this is just a trial run. You know, they've, they've done safety studies on other animals and all that, but they have no idea whether it's going to work or not. But it was an outpatient surgery, injecting this stuff into this kid's eyes. And he was a little bitty kid. He was about four or five at the time. And so his parents, after having put him through the trauma of having a needle stuck in his eyeball, took him to the zoo. And while he was at the zoo, he started screaming. And they were alarmed because, you know, they'd just done this this very weird experimental surgery. Um, and they tried to calm him down and ask him what was wrong. And it turns out what was wrong was that he saw the sun for the first time that fast. He was already able to see. And he now can see, wears like Coke bottle glasses, but he can see. This is a kid that was like totally blind. So the promises of genetic engineering, I'm just getting goosebumps talking about it. It's absolutely enthralling. There are, of course, some downsides. There are other diseases that um, we don't have the capability of figuring out quite as easily. The tissues we need are not quite as easy to reach. Um, in this particular case, ornithine transcarbamylase deficiency. That, so that's an enzyme. What does that enzyme do? Well, duh. It transcarbamylases ornithine. Can, can you not see that? That's just how enzymes are named. So the problem with this is that without this enzyme, the liver is unable to process proteins that are in excess in the diet. You remember we talked about if you eat too much protein, you just store it as fat? Well, the first step in doing that is to break the amino group off of it. And in the process, that amino turns to ammonia. And ammonia is really toxic stuff. Your liver cells handle that ammonia by going through this ornithine cycle in which they convert it to urea. Have you heard of urea? Urea is the waste product produced by the liver that gets in the blood, goes to the kidneys, and is excreted as urine. Are you with me on that? So you take these amino acids that you didn't need to make protein out of. You broke the amino group off. That's ammonia, which is toxic. So you convert the ammonia to urea using the ornithine cycle, which requires this enzyme. So what if you don't have this enzyme? No, there's no medication for it. You can't give these kids this enzyme. It has to be in the liver cells. So what was the source of the ammonia? The excess protein. So tell me about what the kids are allowed to eat. No excess protein permitted. So try telling this teenager that he's not allowed to eat meat. That includes hot dogs and pizza and all those other things that teenagers like. So, yeah. So ammonia is basic. What does that do to the pH? It raises it. And an elevated pH, what was our normal range? 7.35 to 7.45. So it's going to go too high, right? If it goes above 7.45, it hyper excites the neurons in your brain. And that causes seizures and convulsions. And obviously that's disturbing, but if it goes too long, it can in fact cause death, of course. Okay, so if high pH causes seizures because it hyper excites the neurons, tell me what low pH does. If you have acidosis, what's that going to do? Causes suppression of neuronal activity, which is the explanation of diabetic coma. What happens when diabetes is uncontrolled, the pH drops too low, neuronal activity suppressed, patient goes to sleep, basically, is in a coma. So with genetic engineering, we're able to insert genes in to uh, fix those cells. 
and we use viruses as our vector, what's the first thing we have to do? This is true for all drugs or whatever that are approved by the FDA. Make sure it's safe first. May or may not cure what you're trying to cure, but it doesn't matter if people die just from the drug itself. So safety first, efficacy second. And we do have cases where patients were enrolled in these genetic engineering trials and the virus killed them. Their immune system reacted so severely to the virus that they had an immune overreaction, caused liver failure and death. So it's not something we take lightly, it's something we take very seriously, but you're going to see more and more um, genetic engineering to, to fix problems with metabolic diseases. The problem for most of these metabolic diseases is that they're exceedingly rare. Some of them are so rare there may be fewer than 100 cases known worldwide. Um, and some of them are so deleterious that the, the, the infant when born lives either a very short life or may live for a few years but stunted mental development, stunted skeletal growth and, and never you know progress um, and just need lifelong institutionalized care. And in some of them we don't know what's causing it. They go to a specialist and they still can't nail down the cause. So genetic diseases are an important thing for you to be aware of because of the problems that they, um, that they cause, but also because we're able to fix so many of them. All right, so now we're going to back up and talk about cell reproduction. So if you had intro, didn't you do this? Did y'all do mitosis in intro? Yeah, you feel pretty good about that right now, I'm sure. You should. There are two aspects to cell reproduction, and we're not going to be able to go into the amount of detail I would like to, but you need to treat them as if they were two separate things, even though they're clearly hooked together. One is cell division, and the other is DNA replication. DNA replication means copying your chromosomes to get ready to make two copies for two daughter cells. So DNA replication is going to precede cell division. First you synthesize new DNA. You make copies of your genes. And then the cell can divide in two. When DNA replicates, when you make a copy of the DNA, barring mutations, those two copies are identical to each other. Now, mutations inevitably occur, and some of those mutations could lead to problems, but we're going to see that we have ways of checking for that. Each of the two copies of the DNA molecule are held together. They're held together at a region called the centromere, and that centromere actually is a point of attachment for the elements of the cell called microtubules or spindle fibers that are going to pull them apart. To me, this is kind of like if I had, well, we have um, 23 kinds of chromosomes in a human cell. So if I had 23 pages that I wanted to make copies of, and I wanted to make sure that I didn't give one person two copies of the same page and another person no copies of it, I could just paper clip the copies to each other. So I have 23 stacks, each with a paper clip holding the two copies together. Does that make sense to everybody? So that's kind of what we're doing with the centromere. It's kind of just holding the pages together so that they will stick. Um, after you've done the DNA synthesis, the chromosomes actually coil up into visible structures. In this figure, they are red and then they line up in the middle of the cell and then you take your two paper clip copies and you separate them from each other. So you see on the far left of the cell, starting in line, uh, the top of line one, you see that we've separated our copies. Is that reasonably okay with everybody? Any questions about that? Okay, well, of course, that's just part of the whole picture. So 
we just said there are two parts, right? First you replicate the DNA, and then you separate the two copies, so fine. We have to have that in perspective of the whole lifespan of a cell. So when we look at the lifespan of a cell, what we're going to see is that from the time that cell was first formed, which is here, the first thing it's going to do is grow to full size. How big is it when it's first formed? Isn't it half the size of what it started out as? Because that original cell pinched into two. So each of the resulting daughter cells is half normal size. So the first thing it's going to do is grow. And we call that growth phase G1. And G1 doesn't mean growth one, it means gap one. But Never mind, it's G1. So now you see it's grown up to full size. And once it's gone through G1 and it's a mature, full size cell, then depending on what kind of cell it is, it may or may not ever divide again. Many of your mature cells do not ever divide again. They are done with division and they're going to live out the rest of their life, whether that life is 10 days or 3 weeks or 3 months or 60 years. They're going to live the rest of their life sitting at the end of G1. And very often that stage is called G0, and you see that labeled at the top. So if a cell decides it's not going to divide again, it goes into what we call G0. Okay? After it's through growing. If it's going to divide again, it goes next into a phase we call the S phase. S stands for synthesis. And the synthesis phase is when the DNA is replicated. So we don't replicate DNA in cells that are never going to divide again. They just stick with their one copy of everything. Now, what triggers the cell to do that depends entirely on what kind of cell it is and what cell signals there were. Sometimes hormones can trigger division. Sometimes, um, like for immune system, it could be... Um, a uh, factor being secreted by a cell that's been infected. Um, we know now that your muscles actually secrete a growth factor that helps with the growth of other cells in the body, not just cell division, but actually cell support. So that's one of the other reasons exercise is good for you. Okay, but regardless of that, once the DNA is replicated, once we're done with that, we're going to go into a G2. G2 is the second gap phase. In G2, the cell is going to build, assemble, collect, accumulate all the things it needs to divide. There are specific proteins it needs to accumulate for division to occur. So it's going to do that. And there's a particular kind of organelle called a centriole. Centrioles occur in pairs. And every mature cell has one pair. So in preparation, in preparation for division, NG2, that cell will replicate its centriole. So it has two pairs, one for each of the daughters. Does that make sense to everybody? All right. During all these phases of the cell cycle, there are different points where we can um, check them. I'm kind of looking at the time and making sure I have time to do all this. Let me come back to DNA replication. No, I think I better just stop right here. So in the cell cycle, there are two kinds of um, factors that are going to affect its ability to, to carry on. And these factors, we consider them uh, to be at checkpoints. So I have checkpoints here, here, and here, along with here. And at these checkpoints, basically what I have is factors, usually proteins, that are determining whether the cell is normal and healthy or not. 
And if it's deemed to be normal and healthy, then it gets to go on and divide again. And if there's any sign of damage, then it's going to get stopped. So what if I hit a cell with radiation right in here? What did radiation do? Damages DNA, causes mutations. So what will happen as a result of that damage is that will trigger at the next checkpoint the repair enzymes. And those repair enzymes will go up and down the DNA while it's getting ready to be replicated and make sure everything looks normal. And if so, it will say, yes, you can go ahead. And if not, if the DNA is damaged beyond repair, then it will stop it cold and trigger cell suicide. Is everybody with me on the idea of the checkpoints? Any questions about those? Okay, these checkpoint factors have two categories. One of the factor types is the one that says go, and the other one is the brakes. So you've got like a gas pedal and a brake pedal. The brake pedal says stop and wait while we check you. Okay, and then as a result of the check, then what? If it's healthy, then the go pedal says, yeah, you can go ahead. The problem with these stop and go signals is that because they are made of protein, they can be mutated. So you tell me, if I mutate the stop signal, if I mutate the stop signal, and it's not working, what's going to happen to the cell? So cells that are defective are not going to be stopped if the stop signal is defective, right? So what condition is likely to occur then? Cancers are pretty common as a result of defective stop signals. Does that make sense to everybody? Okay, and then opposite of that, what if I don't have the go signal? What if it's not working right? Then, that's, then you have a reduced ability of cells to regenerate themselves, and you have perhaps accelerated aging, or um, in the elderly you may have like, things like thinning of the skin and things that we associate with aging. Make sense to everybody? So those check factors are important. We've got quite a few of them figured out. You know, cancer research is big money, and where there's big money we learn a lot of stuff. And so we know a lot about the cell cycle because of the research that's been done in studying cancer. All right, we're going to focus as briefly as I can manage on DNA replication. It works a lot like transcription. In transcription, I took one copy of the DNA and I made a copy into RNA. Here what I'm going to do is I'm going to take both strands of DNA and each of them is going to make a new copy of their complementary strand. Does that make sense? Using our, our standard of adenine matches with thymine and guanine matches with cytosine. We call this semi-conservative because each half forms the template for the other half. Okay? All right, so it looks something like this, where each strand is, those two strands are pulled apart, and each strand is making a copy of the other strand. In the one direction, hang on. In the one direction, notice that it's continuous, and in the other, it's in pieces. And this just has to do with the way the enzymes read, and we're not going to worry about that. But what I want you to notice here is that if I had a stray X-ray hitting it right here, if it zapped that nucleotide out, what do you think is going to happen next? Usually, it's going to repair, right? But usually in repair, the matching side is right there so it knows what to plug in. But if I just broke it and I thought I had popped one out, here's where I'll get an insertion or a deletion or a substitution. And it is much more likely to be repaired incorrectly when the two strands are separated. Does that make sense to you? 
If they're right next to each other and I zap it, my repair enzyme knows how to read the other side. Here, they're actually not just pulled apart from each other, there's other proteins jammed in between them. They cannot be read together. So I'll still have repair enzymes, they just flat won't know for sure that they're repairing it correctly. So when the DNA is being replicated, if it mutates then, that mutation is more likely to persist. Does it make sense to you that it would? And if that mutation persists and it's non-lethal, then the daughter cell that gets the mutated copy now has a mutation that exists in every generation of that cell from then on. And if that mutation occurs in a cell that it, the ultimate result of it is to form an egg cell or sperm cell, now what? Now I've passed it on to the next generation. Okay, if it happened in a skin cell, and the gene we messed up was one of the, the proteins that puts the brakes on cell division, now I might have skin cancer. But if it's in the germline, that is the cells that are gonna form eggs and sperm, well, now I've got a genetic mutation, okay? Some forms of cancer are so well studied that we know exactly which genes are involved. For example, in colon cancer, we've identified five genes that mutate before the cancer develops. So why does colon cancer run in families? If it takes five mutations for you to actually suffer from colon cancer, how can we say it runs in families? All five of them? Probably not. Maybe, maybe three of them or four. And so in some little epithelial cell in the colon, you've already got four of those genes. You inherited the mutated copies. All it takes is one more, and now you have colon cancer, okay? So they can actually see in family lines where those genes are inherited, sometimes three of them, sometimes four of them already mutated, and now you're definitely more susceptible to colon cancer. And we've done that with other genes as well. You've heard of BRCA, right? The breast cancer genes? BRCA1 and 2, we've identified. Angelina Jolie carried one of those. I can't remember which one. Her mother died of breast cancer. She has six kids. So what's at stake for her if she carries that gene? She doesn't want to die of breast cancer. So what did she do? Y'all keep up with all that celebrity news, right? Double mastectomy, which for Angelina Jolie is saying something. Just saying. Okay. So we can do that. We can do the, the genetic marking, and you can figure those things out. All right, so we looked at some of the causes of mutation. Radiation tends to zap the thymine. Um, viruses, because some viruses actually insert their DNA into your DNA in the host cell. If they insert it right smack in the middle of a gene you need, it's probably going to kill the cell. If they insert it in the middle of a gene that you don't need, but it's in your, the germline, and you pass that viral DNA on to your kids, then they may have a non-functional gene. So you know we had the Human Genome Project, right? Which did what? The genome mapped the entire human genome. And we've done um, the one that the U.S. government funded, they actually did a mix of six people. The one that was funded by Craig Venter's company, guess whose DNA they used? That would be Craig Venter's DNA, because he was the boss. So he did his own genome. But uh, they compiled all the data. All that data is available online, if you know how to use it. And since then, the studies have um, been focused on what to do with that information. So you've seen those companies that will do genetic testing for you, right? 23andMe is one. They send you a little kit. You swab your cheeks, send it back. They do a DNA analysis. They're focusing in on specific genes that we know are correlated with particular conditions. And um, so you can find out what your heritage is, but you can also find out if you're susceptible to Huntington's disease or uh, any of the genetic disorders that have been nailed down. So that's all useful information. Um, in all of that, what they found is that we all carry viruses. We all have viral DNA as part of our genome. In fact, we have so much baggage that we're carrying that if you sat down and tried to edit the human genome down to just the part that was genes, when they started the genome project, they thought there's enough DNA there for about 100,000 genes. 
they've only identified about 30,000. Now, I'm not saying the rest of it is baggage, but some of the rest is defunct genes that have mutated and don't work anymore. Some of it is strictly viral DNA. And you and I have the same viral DNA that is found in other primates. So you can find the same viral signature DNA in humans, all humans, as in gorillas and chimpanzees. That we all carry the same virus. Okay, and that virus is defunct in most of us, but I did read of one clinical case of a guy who came out with a, a specific kind of virus that was known to be latent in humans. It's in our genome and it just doesn't get activated, except it was in him. So reactivation of a virus that infected you 10 generations ago, that's kind of spooky when you think about it. Okay, so tell me why DNA is most susceptible to damage during replication. It's not just because of the non-continuous strand, but because that's when it's split. So the repair enzymes are patrolling, but when they see damage, they can't read the other strand to know how to fix it. Does that make sense to everybody? All right, then answer the second question. What cell populations are most likely to suffer mutation? Brain cells, muscle cells, skin cells, intestinal cells, blood cells. What do you think? Why? Okay, so they're more susceptible to being insulted by the environment, okay? What else? Skin cells, yes, but not only skin cells. Um, but we're talking about what human cells. Reproductive, not so much. Blood cells, why? They're not that close to the environment, they're, I mean, yeah, they circulate through the skin, but the cells that are susceptible to mutation are in your bone marrow, tucked safely away in your bones. So what they have in common is not how easily they are infected or affected, It's their replication cycle. Cells that replicate frequently are in the S phase more commonly. And since the S phase is the phase where most mutations persist and are incorrectly repaired, the more often a cell is in the S phase, the more likely it is to suffer a mutation that persists. That makes sense? So when you look at the kinds of cancer that are common, and of course cancer is runaway cell division, you see skin cancers, both kinds, carcinomas and melanomas. Uh, leukemia, what's that? Blood. It's a cancer not just of the blood, it's a white blood cell cancer. Leuco means white, so it's a cancer of the white cells. Lymphoma, lymph tissues like lymph glands, lymph nodes. Bone cancer, bone cells actually um, don't divide that frequently, but many of the cancers of bone are not of the bone cells, they are of the connective tissues. So that might be bone cancer. And of course, we're gonna learn about more of those later. Least common, neuroma and myoma, what are those cancers of? Neuroma, neurons, myoma, muscle. Nerve cells and muscle cells do not divide that frequently. So you almost never see cancers of the muscle or of the neurons. Now, if you do see, like, brain cancer is not that uncommon, is it? Okay, but if it's a brain cancer, it's still not a neuroma, typically. It's a cancer of the connective tissue of the brain or it metastasized from some other part of the body. Lung cancers will metastasize to the brain. And if it is truly a neuroma, it's probably in a baby and it's probably uh, genetic. And those neuroblasts, the neurons that are still in the early formative stages are the most likely cause of that, okay? So it has to do with how often the cells divide because they're most susceptible in the S phase. Any questions about that? So then as a flip side to that, if we're using chemotherapy to treat your cancer, what are the common side effects of a broad spectrum chemotherapy? 
hair loss. Why would that be? What are the cells that make your hairs? Skin cells. Are skin cells susceptible to? Yep. Okay. Um, vomiting, nausea, intestinal cells replace themselves about every three weeks. So they're susceptible to the effects of the chemotherapy. Anemia, because your marrow cells are susceptible to the chemotherapy. Chemotherapy, broad spectrum chemotherapy works by hitting the DNA. And what it's trying to do is mutate it to oblivion. But it's going to hit any cell that divides rapidly, not just the cancer cells, but also any normal body cells that divide rapidly. Does that make sense to everybody? All right, let's see where we are from there. All right, so I have some terminology for you. I'm not 100% sure that all of this is in the online notes. Should be. If it's not in Chapter 4, it's going to be in Chapter 5, but let's just go ahead and get it. Oma is the term for tumor, so a neuroma or a myoma. Benign means a non-cancerous tumor. I think that's a misnomer. To me, benign means good, or at least not harmful. Can you die of a benign tumor? Oh, yeah, you sure can. It's benign only because the surgeon can remove it easily. If the surgeon opens your skull and sees a benign tumor, it's got a capsule around it, and he can pull the whole thing out. If it's malignant, then it's crab-like, which is where we get the term cancer. It's got little finger-like projections out into the normal tissue, doesn't have a nice, neat capsule around it, and the surgeon is unlikely to be able to remove it all. Okay, so as a tumor grows, if it's in a body part that can expand with the growth, then even if it's benign, it could still, it might cause problems if it compresses blood vessels or it impedes the normal function, but I know people who've had abdominal tumors and they just get a big belly because the tumor just continues to grow and your body expands. If it's in your cranium, yeah, that's not gonna happen. Okay, metastasis is specifically the spread of a cancer. If it metastasizes, then it's cancer. If it doesn't metastasize, then it might be benign. Okay, but benign tumors don't metastasize. Only cancerous tumors metastasize. The fact that tumors can stimulate the blood supply gives us a key way of fighting them because we can actually block the chemical signals that cause an increase in growth. We can block the growth of those blood vessels and starve that tumor. And that's one of the more modern ways that we fight cancer. So onco, you've heard of onco in terms of oncogene or oncologist or oncology. Oncogenes are the genes that, when they're turned on, cause cancer. And some of those are our checkpoint genes, the ones that were the gas pedal or the brake pedal. If the gene is mutated, then it may make the checkpoints not work right, which can allow rapid, uh, rapid cell division. Okay, everybody pretty clear on those? So why do we use radiation as a treatment for cancer? We might actually focus a beam on a tumor that's near the body surface. We take radioactive needles and insert them in the prostate to treat prostate cancer. Why does radiation work? What do you already know radiation does to DNA? It, it, it mutates the DNA. We're hoping it mutates it enough to where the cell basically um, dies out. Okay, so we can block division with some of our cancer drugs. We can starve the cancer by uh, blocking its blood supply, causing necrosis. That's a word that you need to know. What does necrosis mean? <laughs> Cell death. So necrotic tissue, that's not something we want to hear, right? So necrosis is cell death. So 
So why would radiation treatment burn the skin? Tell me about skin cells. They're rapidly dividing cells. So just as nausea with chemotherapy, radiation burns are hitting the cells that divide rapidly and hitting them in that S phase when they're most susceptible to mutation. All right, we already did genetic diseases. Let's see where we are. Because we are about out of time. Um, I want to give you your assignment for next class first before we run out of time. And um, I'm not going to ask you to do too much because when we have class on Monday, yeah, how many of you are planning to take your test before class on Monday, knowing that I'm going to do a review at 8.30? Yeah, not that many of you. So come to class ready to focus on class and then go study for your test once class is over. Is that a reasonable expectation for everybody? The review at 8.30 will be over in Pirtle. It'll be in the cap room, which is just down the hall from lab. Um, yes. Go just start out at your at your cap room. If you don't if you don't have the morning, just look for me in that hall. I'll be I'll just be down the hall, uh, pretty much right across from Miss McGahey's office. If you if you want to look for it that way, I don't remember the room number. I think it's 353, but I'm not 100 percent sure. So what do I need you to do before next class? Review early embryonic development. There are three specific things I need you to be familiar with. They are the three germ layers, the ectoderm, the mesoderm, and the endoderm. You're going to find this at the end of your book, not the beginning. Okay, so it's back in the chapter on development, the last chapter of the book. All right, I didn't quite get through everything on the PowerPoint. What I think I'm going to do is pick up where we left off. Um, also, I inadvertently ended the recording, so this, re this lecture is already going to be in two recordings, and I'll append a third just to go through the rest of the lecture, all right? So if you're coming to the review, I will see you at about 8.30 over in Pirtle, down the hall from lab. Um, otherwise, I'll see you in here at 11.15, ready to move on to new material.